Hello and welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. My name is Scott Daly and I am your host and I'm joined as always by my co-host Matt Freeman, the king of the world. Woo-hoo-hoo. It's okay to make light of tragic events as long as they happened over 100 years ago, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Woo-hoo-hoo. This week, our deconstructing director series continues with James Cameron's seventh film. It's finally time for 1997's Titanic. Oh boy, Matt. Oh boy, here we go. Titanic. Indeed. indeed. Then we are going to be revealing the results from uh, a couple weeks ago's episode on our Doof Cannon series. Uh, we're going to see if Coraline achieved the requisite amount of votes to get into the Doof Cannon of greatest films of all time. Uh, it's I know everyone's waiting for that with bated breath. The suspense is killing all of us, but you're going to have to wait like an hour. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then we're going to wrap this thing up with a quick little beat of me uh, successfully convincing Matt to watch Arcane. That's right. I called my shot at the beginning before I even started the argument. That's how confident I am. Well, um, I look forward to hearing your arguments. I'm going to be <laughs> <laughs> extremely skeptical sure you are uh all right let's get right into it and talk about james cameron's titanic why can't i be like you jack just head out for the horizon whenever i feel like it i've got 10 bucks in my pocket i have nothing to offer you and i know how the world works i'm flying what made you think you could put your hands on my fiance? They've got you trapped, Rose, and if you don't break free, you're gonna die. This ship, there's only so many places she can be. Find her. Iceberg, what I have been robbed. Is this it? Don't you believe it, Rose? Rose! Don't you understand? The water is freezing and there aren't enough boats. Half the people on the ship are going to die. Not the better half. Matt, what is this movie all about? A 17-year-old aristocrat falls in love with a kind but poor artist aboard the luxurious, ill-fated RMS Titanic. God, we were talking about this before, but 17? 17. I mean, that was the choice, was to have her. You know, they never say that, so. Yeah. It's so funny what they choose to put in these in these summaries because it's yeah that's like three words out of a 15 word summary and that information is not in fact in the movie so why not just say like a young yeah a, a young woman a young, a young aristocrat <laughs> whatever yeah uh this movie was of course written and directed by mr james cameron it stars leonardo dicaprio kate winslet billy zane and of course bill paxton playing the role of james cameron in this one <laughs> <laughs> yes yes very much so and Perhaps that's a that's a fun starting place. Is that I I absolutely did not remember that the first twenty one mo- minutes of this movie are uh, in the present day with Bill Bill Paxton taking his submarine down into the Titanic and trying to find a diamond and then not finding a diamond and then calling the woman who turns out to be Rose and then Rose coming to the ship and all this uh-huh. stuff it takes so long. It does. It's a that. very it's a very long build up, but I think it is it is a really important thing about this movie. I was thinking about this a lot. I think there's a different version of this movie that is just everything that takes place in 1912, right? The movie opens in 1912 and ends in 1912, and that's the story. But uh, James Cameron didn't want to do that. He wants to have this kind of bookend story about this treasure hunter kind of becoming obsessed with Titanic and obsessed with finding this diamond, then learning the true story and experiencing the true story of it and, uh, and, and learning something. And that is the James Cameron story. I mean, that's the most interesting. I was joking in the intro, but like Bill Paxton is very clearly just playing James Cameron in this movie. Uh, Like the idea that perhaps he, he was interested in Titanic and he, he was like anxious to go down there and plumb its depths to find the treasure of the story that he could make a movie out of, right? And then as he became more and more obsessed and learned more and more of the stories, he learned what like what it what it was like and what it meant and and the the emotions and the 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 devastation and the tragedy behind all of it. And it was opened up to him on a much more personal level. And so he makes this movie all about really a character experiencing what it means to have been on the ship. And it changes that person. And I think that's this is Bill Paxton's arc measures James Cameron's arc over the yeah. co- course of making this movie. I, I like that interpretation a lot. And, and I'll, ask, I'll sort of layer on another interpretation to that, which is 
that it's very easy to think about something that happened a long time ago and distance yourself from it automatically. That was yeah. sort of the joke I was making in the intro of, of like things that happened a long time ago. We can just laugh about it because it's like you're not going to hurt anybody's feelings because nobody's left alive who was involved in it, which I mean, whatever. It's what people tend to do. Yeah. Um, and, and and it's easy to think like, yeah, that was a long time ago, right? But by connecting it to a modern day plot line and then in, indeed having Rose show up as an elderly person in the present day that really anchors it to like, oh, this, these are people just like you and me that this happened to. And, and then when you go back in time, you're thinking of them as people just like you and me, instead of thinking of them, of them as people from the olden days, they're not like us. They don't think like us. They, they don't feel fear like us, you know, which yeah. obviously they did. And, yeah. I love that. I, I don't think anything illustrates that quite as well as with the one guy explaining how the Titanic sunk, right? He's got his computer generated model and he's kind of explaining and, and telling Rose for some reason uh, why and exactly the way in which Titanic sank, which I mean, really it's for us. Like it's, it's a really clever thing Cameron's doing there. It's like by by like feeding it to us via exposition, we kind of understand exactly how the sinking is going to go. And so there's there's never a moment in the last 30 minutes of the movie where you're confused because you completely understand what's happening with the ship because he's told you already, mm -hmm. um, which is just really clever. But it's also like the difference between this computer graphic version of the story and 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 the the real experienced version of the story. And I think the thing you know, we talked about this in True Lies last week about the reason those action sequences were so good is because there's people everywhere mm -hmm. and there's people experiencing and reacting to the action sequence and what's going on. And I really think that's one of the, the key successes to this movie is there's people everywhere. And I, I, one thing I noticed is, is how much, especially in the final moments, how much Cameron is cutting to these other people. Like mm -hmm. we, we, we see Rose on top of the ship and she looks over at the the chef that's next to her um and they have like this brief moment where they look at each other or there's the one woman that's like you know draped in, in her man the same way rose is with jack and and they exchange this moment and look at each other and and even like there's several vignettes throughout the course of the sinking that like we just cut to people that we recognize because we've seen them throughout the course of the movie and we know who these people are we know who this irish woman with her two little children are we know mm -hmm. who the old man and woman uh sleeping on the bed as the water rushes by are like we've spent so much time with these people before the tragedy even starts that like it, it becomes personal because we do know all of them. Yeah. We, like it's not just a smokestack falling on a random person. It's a smokestack falling on Fabrizio, yeah. uh, Jack Dawson's friend. Yeah, absolutely. I, I found it all, I guess, I guess I'll just say like surprisingly affecting, emotionally affecting. Cause like I, I, I'm sure I've watched this movie a handful of times. I definitely watched it in the theater when it came out. Definitely watched it a few times over the years. And somehow, and I guess I haven't watched it in, in a really long time because I, I was, it really got me in the end, you know, as you're watching all these people die and, you know, part of it is knowing like this is real. Many, many, you know, over a thousand people died, many of them children. Mm -hmm. This is, this is just a horribly sad, true thing. And like, even, yeah, it wasn't these literal people because these are actors. That's, that's Vasquez from Aliens, but definitely like <laughs> something similar to this probably happened. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I love, like you said, the, the, the moments of connection because by, by, you know, I think there's a sort of, there's a sort of thing that is, that maybe it's sort of what you think of as like the Roland Emmerich disaster movie where, where it just shows a bunch of isolated instances of, of terrible things happening. Yeah. Which is this, this movie kind of does, but also like you just pointed out connecting them specifically in these, these, you know, slow, quiet human moments mm -hmm. where, you know, not, nothing's happening when she just, when she, well, other than the fact that they're sitting on top of the ship that's sinking in this incredibly dramatic way, but it's this still quiet moment when she shares eye contact with the, you know, with the chef. Yeah. And it just, and, and all, all that's meant to be conveyed there is like the, the, the mortal terror of what's happening and, and the hopelessness of it. Yeah. And the, and the, the, yeah, it's just this moment of humanity amidst this terrible tragedy where we're like, we both, we both are acknowledging each other's existence and the fact that we're probably both about to die. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, incredibly terrifying. And, and I think that is what really, really turns on the feels is those, those small moments 
that allow you to kind of project yourself on this moment and say, what would I be feeling right now if I'm on the top of the Titanic? It's just broken in half. It's bobbing in the air, hundreds of feet up in the air. And then suddenly the final moments start happening at fi- and it starts slowly sinking. And I look over and I see another person standing there and he's just as terrified as I am. And we both have this look of confused fear on our faces and we don't know what happens next or what we're going to do or if we're going to be alive in an hour from now. And it's just it's just so fucking powerful. Mm. Uh, Matt, I, I just want to say, like, we just jumped into it, but I just want to say here, I fucking love this movie. I think this is, I, I I am, this this watch convinced me that this is absolutely one of my favorite movies. This probably would be in my top 10 favorite movies. I think this is Cameron's masterpiece. I think this is a, a damn near perfect movie in just about every way. And I... I can't believe just how much it worked on me on this rewatch. Like mm-hmm. it, like I've seen this movie many times. I, I saw this movie in the theater four times um, because my sister was really into it. And I'm going to be honest with you. I lied a little bit when I told that story uh-huh. because yes, my sister was really into it, but, but I was too, but uh-huh. I was a, but I was a, was 12 year old boy. And it was embarrassing to be really into Titanic. Cause that was that gushy romance movie, right? No, I loved this movie the first time I saw it. And I, continue to love it to this day it's fantastic yeah. it's um i guess i guess just since you just mentioned it the, the romance part is it's like really good actually <laughs> yeah. like like there's um i think overall this project the deconstructing of of cameron's films has made me respect him as a screenwriter as as a writer yeah, more than I already did. I mean, I knew he was this great action director. I knew he had developed that he had directed so many of the movies that I loved and that were influential on me. But I kind of thought it was just like, yeah, it's because he's so good at shooting the action and he's so good at creating these action set pieces. I mean, I would always talk about like the ending of Terminator Two, the ending of of Aliens, and so forth. But like just the just the basics of the of the falling in love. And um, like shit, man. There's nothing more erotic than the scene in the in the uh, car, the, yeah. the 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 sex scene where you don't even see anything. But it's like it's just it's perfectly done. It's using all of the techniques of film and storytelling to yeah. make it incredibly uh, you know powerful, regardless of the fact that it's it's pretty tame in terms of what it's objectively showing. Yeah. Um, I, I think the term melodrama gets a bad rap. I think mm-hmm. pe- when people say the word melodrama, they say it in a negative connotation usually. I think this is a very melodramatic movie in all the best ways. I mm-hmm. mean, like like just the the villains and the good guys and and the 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 cheesiness of some of the dialogue at at times, it's filled to the gills with melodrama. But it is it is the poster child for why melodrama is so damn effective because yeah, I mean, you really get invested in this. You really get invested in this relationship and 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 bless his heart, James Cameron gives us so much time to get invested in Rose and Jack. Like the, the thing I, I mean, obviously the, the, the thing that everyone says, it's an hour and 41 minutes before the ship hits the iceberg, which is crazy. Cause that's like a whole, there's a whole movie in there that's a whole mm-hmm. movie, but not even that just like, as you said, the time where we spend or we see Titanic crashed at the bottom of the ocean before we even see what it looks like in 1912, we spend all that time and, and the sheer amount of time we spend with Jack and Rose. I forgot just how long the scene is with them, you know, after he saved her life, them just strolling around the ship and just talking. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's just like 10 minutes of the two of them just talking about themselves and their lives and, and the ways she feels trapped and the way he feels free and like uh, all the stuff. And like, it, it, I, it's just remarkable how much time we spend on it where any other movie would be kind of, okay, let's get to the, the action parts. No, mm-hmm. this, this movie allows itself to play out very, very slowly and deliberately. And yeah. I, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's interesting how there's a lot of things where I, I feel like a a younger version of me might call them flaws. But now I see them as choices, <laughs> which in fact make the, it, in fact, it kind of has to be that way. Like one thing you said to me earlier was the, the fact that Jack is a character who's almost a perfect person. He, yeah. he has he has no flaws. He has no arc. And one thing that you said that I really liked is is it's almost like uh, Jack is just Rose's memory of Jack. Mm-hmm. It, he's not really a fully fleshed out person because this is her idealized 
memory of this of this man who she knew for really a very very brief time and and so he's it's a bit it's a bit rose tinted if you'll forgive me the <laughs> pun um and and I love that read on it and it's like again like I said I think maybe you're tempted to say uh you know Jack's just not a very deep character and it's like well that's true but I think that there's a reason for that it's because that's what this story demands, actually. Yeah. That's what's required by this particular story. The same thing could be said for what you just said about melodrama, where it's like, all right, so like what, you want like a subdued mumblecore movie about the sinking <laughs> of the, the RMS Titanic where a thousand no. people died? Like, no, it's it's an incredibly, it's a, it's a, it's a ridiculous story. It is. It, it is like, <laughs> it, like, like I, you have to attribute at least half of the success of this movie to the fact that the, just the base story of the Titanic is already one of the most absurd Greek tragedy stories in existence. Yes. Like just the real story, no, ad, no added melodrama, no added anything. It's insane. Everything yeah. about it is insane. Yeah, right. It's it, it's it's like it, it's exactly it's uh it's stranger than fiction it's yeah. it's uh the the, the maiden voyage the maiden voyage of of the most powerful largest and most impressive and most luxurious ship ever built and it and it happens to hit an iceberg in just the exact way to 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 sink it instantly and, and oh they didn't have enough lifeboats and oh you know just just la- like layers of like improbabilities to just make it make you see make you be like you know i remember um when this movie came out the history channel you know, kind of caught on to the, the, the hype train yeah, and the, and the, you know, maybe it was discovery channel, maybe it was history channel. I don't remember. It's probably that, a little of both. <laughs> probably, probably there'd be, there'd be a bunch of documentaries about like, about how the Titanic sank and just, just, doc, just tons of different documentaries. And, and there was almost this feeling, this pervasive feeling of like, but what really happened? How did this really happen? Cause it's, because your mind is almost like, this is just too unlikely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But of course it, it did happen. It happened pretty much exactly the way the movie shows it, I think. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's almost entirely accurate. I think since the movie came out, they've discovered more like a larger field of wreckage. Like, I think the one thing the movie doesn't focus on is what happened to the aft section. Where did that go? And Mm -hmm. I can't remember if they had found it at that time. They've, Mm -hmm. they've since found it. The most tragic thing about it is they can't get it off the bottom of the ocean and it's deteriorating, right? Mm -hmm. Like in a, in a few dozen years, it's just going to be completely gone. Mm-hmm. which is just kind of wild but yeah i mean it, it's a, it's a ridiculous story it's 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 filled with its own kind of melodrama like yeah like the 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 hubris it is there already the tragedy is there already the idea like i read this today that actually they had more they had more lifeboats than required by the british whatever like whatever government organization was monitoring lifeboat safety on on ships um, they they met the requirement and exceeded it on this boat, mm-hmm. despite the fact that they didn't have enough for a third of like, I think it was a third of all crew and passengers. Mm-hmm. And then they, of course, didn't fill the boats, the boats near capacity because there was no organization. There was chaos and uh, they didn't want to make the the rich folks uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's certainly a big, important part of the movie that I hadn't thought mm-hmm. about in a while is just how how mad you get at, at how at just like the sort of needlessness of, of certain aspects of the tragedy. I mean, yeah. them hitting the iceberg in the first place, that's just sort of act of God, you know, okay, now the ship's going to sink. What are you going to do? And you start thinking, okay, well, like, couldn't this have been done better? Damn it. You know? Yeah. Like th- at least that's what I was thinking while watching it this time. Like I kept, I kept sort of doing the thing where I'm like, what would I do in this situation? And tr- sort of trying to be honest about it because, um, it's hard. It, it's it's easy to tell yourself that you're going to be a hero, right? Yeah. But it's funny because I, I <laughs> like, I was noticing how many of the characters they would have be like, we're just going to like nobly face our death. And I, I think I noticed a lot more on this viewing. Like every one of the characters who decides to nobly face their death is still obviously scared shitless. Yeah. When, when yeah. the moment actually comes. I think because, it was Guggenheim yeah. that like dresses in his best and says, mm-hmm. we're going to face this like men. Um, and then, yeah, the, the water breaks into the central atrium, whatever. And he has this look of abject terror on his face. It's so, it's so good. Yeah. That, that, that choice there is so good. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's nothing like, and, and you know, similarly like the, the, the musicians playing until the end, it's like, there's something we want to be able to make death noble 
and and have dignity but it's like in, in the end i think it's purely terrifying especially yeah. in a in a sudden a sudden nightmarish disaster like that yeah totally i mean i i love that it, like he he mixed and weaved these true stories right the, the guggenheim story is true the the band playing to the end is true like a lot of the different story like i think the old man and woman are actually like owners of macy's mm -hmm. um they owned several of macy's and they really did just the what, it, what we're told is they were uh they elected to just lie in their bed and die um mm. she did not want to leave him and so they, they did that um the mr andrews like the last he was seen was st like sitting in a stateroom staring at a picture of a titanic mm. uh, like so like cameron has taken these facts of this thing or, or at least the eyewitness testimony of everything and kind of woven them into the plot of his story in really fascinating ways where we can cut to those real life moments we can cut to moments where the, the one guy that shoots himself in the head that did happen mm. but we we weave him into our story so we make the guy that he sh murders before he kills himself is a character we know um and that's like it's very clever how he kind of he kind of constructs these not real characters and, and weaves them through the story the real story well you know what's funny is when the guy shot himself in the head i, I th that was one moment while on this viewing when i thought to myself like yeah it's a little mel melodramatic i don't <laughs> You know, and then you tell me like, no, that that actually happened. So nope, it's that like, did, yeah, that did happen. Yeah, that, that's that's what I mean when I when it's like, there's no, the only way to do this true story justice is to is to meet it at the level that it's at, where it's like incredibly dramatic and incredibly tragic, and yeah, you know, it's uh, this movie was was ridiculously popular when it came out. It's it's hard to even express, you know, to to anyone who wasn't around back then how sort of culturally yeah. central this movie was when it came out. I mean, it was number one at the box office for 15 weeks in a row, mm -hmm. which uh, will never happen again, ever. Mm -hmm. um, it actually, like, it was still playing in 400 screens when it was released on VHS, which is just <laughs> insane. Yeah. They were having to send new reels to the theaters. Uh, this was back when things were still projected on film because they, the movie was being played so much that the reels were wearing out. Um, it, it's just like the the insanity of this sweeping the nation in this kind of you know monoculture way is remarkable and i think what, what what has happened over time is there's kind of been a backlash to that as there is to anything that becomes you know so culturally significant that it kind of takes over and and so a lot of people look back at this movie very negatively and i i'm here to tell you that no um the reason why this movie caught on and impacted and and triggered something in so many people is because it is constructed in this, this meticulous brilliant way to appeal to every part of anyone that goes to the theater to watch this movie like it is it is truly a four quadrant movie but not it it never feels like in the in the the sterile manufactured you know kind of way it's just it's just an epic it's just an epic movie about an epic story that like feels that way from the beginning that's one thing i didn't even you didn't even realize but the movie opens up with this kind of this the slow haunting music which the score of this movie is incredible it's so good but the slow haunting music and then just like slow-mo images of of all the people on the titanic i i don't i don't think that was it was 1912 that wasn't real footage no um uh, people just like waving goodbye and it's in black it's in the sepia black and white and then it fades out to just water and then titanic appears on the screen it's like the movie is declaring itself to you is like this is going to be fucking epic strap in mm -hmm. it's just so it's so effective at everything it does like everything yeah right i this, i think maybe i said something like this last last week but just this movie made me appreciate that Cameron is not just this, you know, action director who understands action. He understands mm -hmm. everything. He's just a really good storyteller. He understands yeah. how to if if there is a mood to be dialed in, I think he can do it between between writing and and uh the power of his direction, you know. Yeah. I, I I like like I said, I was I was surprisingly emotionally affected by the ending of this movie and you know, the way he lets the moments toward the end where like the, the amount of time we spend just with Rose um, in the water and, and Jack in the water at the end. Mm -hmm. And it's just this long, incredibly sad, you know, expanse of time Yeah, where we're just, it's just, and he, and he's just kind of heaping the sadness upon us and really kind of making us, making us feel it and not giving us a, a way out of it. 
you know, the surprisingly long time that it takes her to get the boat's attention is yeah. just this wonderful, like, kind of, like, you, you, you desperately, you're, you like so desperately want her to survive at that point, right? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, so like, invested. The, when, um, when, like, she she gives up but then like redoubles her strength because she remembers her promise and like starts yelling out come back and it's this choked barely audible noise and you're just like come on rose like like you yeah. i mean the, the the most hilarious thing is we know she gets out of it right the 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 bookend conceit of this movie makes us know that she survives but in that moment you're just like come on we're just ready to see one little tiny bit of hope yeah. um in, in this thing and yeah it is so intense and i agree with you the movie lets it sit with it i mean the ship sinks th with 30 minutes left in the runtime of the film and mm -hmm. some of that is present day stuff but a lot of that is just them in the water just these these wonderful powerful shots of i, I think the first time the camera pulls back and we see just how many people are in the water splashing and screaming is one of the most powerful affecting shots to me when you're just like you fully understand the scope of it and then you dive into the specific i think that's mm -hmm. one thing this movie does very well is 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 cameron knows when to pull back and show you the scope of this destruction and then zoom back into our two central characters which are kind of avatars of the tragedy like we you can kind of assume that this tragic story is being repeated over and over and over and over and over and over again everywhere yeah. else and it's it's so it's so fucking effective man it's like he does such a damn good job of, of all of it. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Just the, the fact that each of these deaths is just as tragic as as Jack's death. And yeah. in fact, Jack is not a real person, but a thousand real people did die. And that's that's what you're seeing. And yeah, oh, the God. one that the one that really fucked me up the most this time was the woman floating in the water holding her infant baby. Mm -hmm. um, and I, obvi for obvious reasons, I have a, a, an infant right now. So that like that got me where I live. Like I, that was I was overwhelmed with emotion and I could like I had to stop the movie for a second yeah. to like collect myself because it's, it's just like I just put my son's face on that that frozen baby like immediately without my control. And it's just it f it fucked me up. Yeah, it's funny you say that because the moment that got me was when uh uh, Vasquez is 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 basically <laughs> trying to she she has her two children in bed yeah and it's clear that like they're just not going to get off the ship so she's trying to just keep them calm yeah and 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 like my kids are that's sort of the average age of my kids yep. I guess you could say and I I was just like nope yep. gotta 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 not watch this right now um it, you know it's it's just too horrible it's too horrible you know um like the, and that's I, I guess that's yeah i guess that's the special the special thing about this movie is that it not only does it go there but it like stays there for, yeah. for an hour um, yeah you live in it i mean it's and again it's it's not just like you you met that little girl like that mm -hmm. little girl that vasquez is talking to we've seen her multiple times that's the little girl that that jack danced with you know mm. that's like these are these are people that we've taken the time to learn and we've been talking since the beginning about james cameron's ability to characterize you know that's the thing that made aliens so great is we really got to know all these people and this is i think the the greatest and largest example of that because all of these characters are so unique and distinct like even even the the you know we have the captain then we have mr andrews and we have the, the other guy the businessman that demands that the ship go faster like every one of these people is so is characterized just enough to where you remember them and you have an, an, an emotion attached to them whether it's a good one or a bad one mm -hmm. i think i think I don't know for for some reason Mr. Andrews is the the most tragic character to me um because he's just so upset about everything like he built the ship mm -hmm. he's taking personal responsibility for this whole thing and uh who's who's the actor who plays him? Victor Garber who's an incredible actor just plays this character with this kind of this this sh like from the moment the ship starts sinking he's just he just is uh, like unconsolable like he just yeah. doesn't know what to do anymore and he just can't can't believe it he can't believe it and it's it's mm -hmm. a perfect performance yeah it's, it's this terrible guilt and yeah he, it, it's almost like from that moment he's yeah i don't think we ever see him put a life vest on because i think no. he's just he's just like yeah i'm i'm not getting off of this shit yeah i'm 
Yeah. And that and that scene where he he you know where we go over why the ship is going to sink and he goes through is like we were built the ship was built to stay afloat with with four bulkheads flooded mm-hmm. but not five and that like the ship's going to the water's going to spill over the watertight doors and back and back and back it's a mathematical certainty that is one of the most powerful scenes in the movie for me and I think like I, the way Cameron shoots that scene is very interesting to me because he's like he he's doing a, a fair amount of cutting but then in that last part he kind of stops cutting and has the camera move between the captain and Mr. Andrews mm-hmm. in this like slow kind of very dramatic tilt and and push in on the characters as they're coming to realize these things. Uh, I think it's just really powerful camera work. And I mm-hmm. think that I think that's true across the board too. One of the things I really noticed is just James Cameron, uh, first of all, is in love with Kate Winslet's eyes, like like mm-hmm. obsessed with them, but also just eyes in general. This is, I think, this movie has more close-ups than I think I've seen in any Cameron movie up until this point. He's like really, really interested in getting right up in with people on the ship. And I think that's to, you know, to to get up in them, to make it personal, to make you feel like you're there type of choices. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a very different directing style in general, I feel. Mm-hmm. I mean, we just watched True Lies. And I don't know that there's much that I would pick out between these two movies and say, yeah, that's a characteristic Cameron thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like maybe there's a couple of jokes in the script where I'm like, God, that's such a James Cameron joke. But it's just, um, it's so, it is very different. Like he, he, he very kind of, I think consciously went for a whole different style. Yeah. I think he understands that he needs to he really needs to dial in the romance. And so he allows that to be in a a slightly different style. I found some of the the action sequence filmmaking really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the choices like when when Rose is running down the corridors looking for help, how Cameron switches to this first person view for her a few times Mm -hmm. where we just like the camera just is like at a, at a T junction in corridors and the camera like is whipping back and forth between all the empty corridors. It really, really emphasized the claustrophobic maze like nature of those corridors and just helped ramp up the tension as Rose is desperately trying to find someone. I, I just thought that was just some clever stuff. And I don't know if I've ever seen him do that kind of first person perspective in his, any of his movies. Yeah. I don't remember seeing that. Like, like you would think that it would be an aliens if it was going to be in anything. And I, I don't think it is. So. There I, now that you mention it, there might be there might be some moments of that in Aliens. Not remember. I mean, maybe maybe sort. Yeah, I, I don't know. I see. I just watched Aliens because I showed it to my older kids. But um, <laughs> oh well, I'll trust your your most recent uh, memory then. Which which by the way, the theatrical cut got such a better movie. <laughs> I did not. I did not curse my children by showing them the director's cut. Well, good good job. But yeah, um, you were talking about the way that it was showing the the captain and the um, and the guy who built the ship, and I just wanted to mm-hmm. remark on how like how much kind of differently the captain stuff landed with me mm-hmm. because I guess I, I don't know. I think just being older, I was able to like accurately understand what was happening better and how he just kind of like collapses in on himself. Yeah, and of course it's it's uh, I forget the actor's name, but it's it's King Theoden, who's a great actor, obviously. And but but it's very subtle, and so there's the the way that he is, he has basically decided that he's basically immediately like uh, I'm gonna um, this is this is a shame I can't possibly live with, and I'm gonna just kill myself. But 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 he but like it's worse than that because he doesn't take leadership. Like he doesn't try to conduct an effective evacuation. He just kind yeah. of like people will ask him questions, and he literally just kind of like glances at them and then walks away. Yeah, like the the guy says, shouldn't we ought to get the women and children first, sir? Mm-hmm. And he's like, huh, what? Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do do that. You're uh-huh. you're you're totally right. And I love this because you know this is this is a movie with your very clear and distinct heroes and villains, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like every bad guy, like I think Mister Ismay is the is the businessman, and he's clearly a villain. You know, mm-hmm. comes full circle when he takes a spot in the the lifeboat and you're just like man fuck you buddy Mm -hmm. Uh, of course billy zane's character clearly a villain and and the captain is in this interesting position between all that because it's very subtle in the choices that he makes right because he's he's being precautious and then he's kind of convinced by ismay to to go faster Mm -hmm. and 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 there's that moment where they briefly cut back to the present where where like 
he, you know, they talk about the captain and he's got 25 years of experience telling him he's okay and everything he knows is wrong, you know? So it's like this thing where he is being a little bit greedy. He is, this is his, his retirement voyage and he wants it to be success and he wants to be remembered as the guy that brought Titanic in. But, but on the other hand, he just like, he didn't, no one, no one understood the full scope of of the vulnerabilities of this ship you know like they just they just didn't they just didn't know it It was the first voyage she had never been fully tested like the ship never had to corner like it just never had to they like how were they supposed to know and and i love like cameron's choice of showing us like the detailed mechanisms of how to slow the ship up or speed the ship up or slow the ship down like this, this very kind of slow, deliberate, like, okay, I have to go to a thing and then I have to turn the thing over, which turns a little arrow, which alerts the people down below that they need to do their stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's so much like spinning of, of wheels to let out steam. And like, it's just this incredibly slow, arduous process to even get to even just have the engine go, okay, stop and then reverse and then hard to start, you know, like yeah. it's just this incredibly laborious process all across the board. Yeah, it's like this is like the one thing in the universe that could have actually sunk this ship. Yeah, <laughs> is is striking an iceberg at high speed, and and that's the thing is like that they didn't expect to be hitting an iceberg because you would normally see an iceberg, but it was like yeah. these weird visual conditions too. Yeah, that's yeah the the uh, um. The, the the one scene that I that I really appreciated this time, very very minor, is when the captain, like one of the officers, brings up the idea that it's going to be harder to see the icebergs, and and we see the captain, like he has his cup of tea and he like is glancing down to the tea and kind of almost like nervously, like spooning it around. Yeah. And, and and then and then he just looks up and he's like, yeah, all right, I'm going to bed. And it's like that was the moment. I, yeah. I just I love it because it's like the moment of him feeling feeling doubt, feeling uncertainty for just a moment, and then deciding like, nah, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's all fine. It's really you're 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 absolutely right. That's it's it's such a wonderful moment because yeah, you I mean that's the thing that that Cameron is playing with in in the, the first half of this movie is the fact that everyone that is seeing this movie knows how it's going to go. Right? Mm-hmm. He's playing yeah. with that a lot. Like there are these constant conversations about number of lifeboats and ordering of more speed and icebergs and like this constant stuff that we're playing with. And it allows the audience to really have this this investment on a level of like, oh, that was the moment right there. And I don't know, it's a small thing, but he's he's there's a lemon in his tea. And like, mm-hmm. as he's looking down to consider it, he like sinks the lemon into the tea. <laughs> and I don't even know if that was intentional imagery or if it's just like to have something to distract him so he doesn't have to to deal with the issue that's being presented. But I, I thought that was a nice touch as well. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah, love that. There's, I mean, the performances are all great, but mm-hmm. we've already talked a bit about Kate Winslet. And I, I mean, Leo, it's funny because now he's gone on to have this far ranging career. Yeah. Um, but like this is this movie is sort of Leonardo DiCaprio at his most likable. Yeah, um, this is a quintessential young Leo movie. Mm-hmm. Like this is this is the way he acted as a younger man, and yeah. he's he's remarkable. I think he's so likable. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the thing is like it, it's true that he doesn't have an arc, but he's just you're you just kind of love him and want to root for him. Uh, he just brings this like youthful energy and and vigor and joy and and joy de vivre to everything um and you totally get why he's attractive to kate winslet um and and vice versa like it's just everything on the screen is is works perfectly and is compelling and i i, I mean i i i think maybe it, it much like it's popular to to bag on titanic it's popular to bag on, on leo but mm-hmm. it's like i don't know i think it's i think it's absolutely the performance that this movie calls for actually yeah totally and i love i love the ways in which it's because he's so likable that you can see how threatening everyone else is because I, I the dinner scene it continues to be remarkable every time I see it but the way he like manages to win over everyone at the table with the exception of Billy Zane and Rose's mother because he's just so charming mm-hmm. that these are you know uh, hoity aristocrats who who like have been told that this kid is basically street trash mm-hmm. and are are very kind of standoffish to him and and yet despite all of Miss DeWitt Decatur's machinations to make to turn the table against him 
his charisma and his likability kind of wins out over all of them. And his, his speech about making it count while it is cheesy and melodramatic, like everything else in this movie, it, it is, it is charming and effective. And he just owns the table. This is a, this is a place where he doesn't belong. And Mm. he, he flourishes there. He flourishes anywhere and everywhere he is. Yeah. And it's, and it's a, it's a scene that I think works 90% because of Leo and, and then an, an additional 90% because of James Cameron. Yeah. Um, adding up to a total of 180%. <laughs> the, the one thing I, I never noticed, there's a scene where he hands a pen back to Molly Brown. And I mm-hmm. never noticed that before because, of course, he's written a note for uh, Rose. Mm-hmm. But I, I just don't know why I ever note, did notice that that's where he got the pen from. Mm-hmm. Like, it, I never really thought about it because I'm not going to like, plot hole, where did, where did Leo <laughs> where get- did he? Yeah. yeah where to get the but, stationary yeah but but even so like there's yeah there's this little brief moment where he hands something back to to molly and you don't even really know what it is until you see that he's written a note and so he just got a pen and yeah. slipped slipped kate a note which like that that is one of those that is one of those shots you know sometimes as a director you you just gotta know that i found the perfect shot and the moment where Leo is waiting at the top of the stairs, standing next to the clock, and Kate walks up, and we we I think we go first person there. I think we go first person as we follow through Kate's eyes up the stairs to approaching Leo, and he turns around and looks right into her eyes, aka our eyes. Mm-hmm. It's just the perfect sequence. Like there's so much majesty and and drama and romance to just the way he turns and looks at her, aka us. Yeah. No, absolutely. I and and you know all the all the other actors in the in the room, of course, are also doing this. You know, just beaming smile, right? Yeah. Actually, yeah. Anyway, that that's yeah, that's that's great. the 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 ending the ending is such a perfect clockwork machine design oh, to yeah. make human beings cry. I wasn't even talking about the ending version. I was talking about the one yeah. right after the dinner. But it's the same shot, and that's yeah. what makes it remarkable. I realized that halfway through talking that, that, you, were, <laughs> that you were referring to that scene. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and then that that ending scene, the ending scene is the ending shot is also like a perfect shot. Is is uh, it's funny because I was I got the two perfect shots confused. Yeah, um, no, it it is perfect. So okay, there's a few there's a few more things we need to talk about. I, okay. I want to get into the technical side of this movie because it is remarkable what they did but i think we need to do something first matt and we talked about this beforehand we've got to talk about the fucking door that (laughs) that rose floated on and we've got to squash this thing once and for all so if 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 you've been living under a rock audience there is this very popular meme that has existed around this movie forever that there was clearly room on the door that rose is floating on for jack and that she was selfish and not letting him on the door and he could, they could have both fit uh-huh. on there. That's, that's the dumbest fucking thing yeah. I ever heard. And it's, it's textually wrong in the movie. If, if you just watch the movie, <laughs> they, they both try to get up on the door. Uh-huh. It immediately starts to swamp and go under and tip. And then she gets on the door and you can see, that it's that it's not that big. I have a story yeah. about being in Boy Scouts as a youth, and there was this little river, and we the 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 dumb kids together decided we were gonna build a raft. So we collected some wood that was lying around and some rope that we had for tying our knots. We tied it into a raft and it looked like quite a sturdy raft to us. And then one of us tried to get on the raft and it immediately sunk completely underwater. <laughs> Because wood is not very buoyant on its own unless it's been shaped into something that holds, you know, an air, an air pocket, Uh i.e. a boat, (laughs) which, which a door is not. There was no, it's stupid. It's a stupid, annoying meme. There's, it's so stupid because there's people that like (laughs) take, take measurements of the thing and then show how both of their bodies could fit on the board. And it's like, it's not about space. It's about buoyancy. And it's all in the movie. Like in, you're absolutely right in the movie. She climbs on, he tries to get on, the thing lifts into the air and starts to sink and tip, and they almost both fall in. He keeps her back on, and then, to cap this all off, James Cameron does like a 10 to 20 second scene where the camera just lingers on Jack's face as he comes to the realization, this thing won't fit us both. I'm fucked. This is it for me. I'm mm-hmm. going to die, and the only thing I can do in this moment is is keep 
keep Rose going because she has a chance here. Being out of the water, she has a chance. I don't. And he makes that decision. You can see it on Leo's face. And just like this, this is the dumbest fucking meme <laughs> ever. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah. Well, it's it's typical of of like the the way people complain about this movie, which is like I, I've there's a kind of person who will react that way to a, to a dramatic movie and, and in a kind of similar mocking way to a scary movie where it's like they want to deny that the film has affected them. And so they, they nitpick and criticize in, in like very superficial ways so they sure. don't have to feel emotions. Yeah. And I think that's what this is. Yeah. And, and like, uh, for, I mean, there are definitely people that are just like having fun with it. Right. That are just like joking around about it. But then like, you know, anytime an article about Titanic is written, it's like, there's get there's going to be someone that mentions it up oh, the infamous scene at the end of the movie where she clearly has room yeah. for Jack on that humongous yeah. floating door. If you're not familiar with wood or flotation or <laughs> it's that's I mean, the most frustrating part is you don't even have to be familiar with wood or flotation. You just have to watch the fucking movie in which James Cameron has meticulously laid out the series of events for you. Uh -huh. OK, well, we're done with that. We've successfully squashed that. No one yeah. should ever talk about that again for the rest of existence because it's we've done it we've yeah. done it good i'm glad so uh the technical side of this movie matt there's a lot here that is absolutely incredible just i mean the the the, the amount of time it took to film everything like to create scale versions of the titanic and do a lot of the stuff to flood places with water and i mean this is another movie where our actors were horrifically abused on set um uh -huh. I, I i read somewhere that kate winslet got a bruise so bad that the makeup crew was like oh <laughs> can we can we take pictures of that bruise to help us make more realistic bruises with our makeup later <laughs> oh my god and it, she she chipped a bone in her uh, elbow how does uh -huh. that happen yeah i wonder what scene that was in because like how many stunts were really i mean i guess everything we see her doing she's actually yeah. doing clear i mean yeah. it, it's just the, the question is what exactly is the set that yeah, I, I don't know what my question know. is exactly like it whatever we see her do she actually did so yeah th there are times when she has to jump over things climb over things you know, fall that particularly when they're climbing, they're sort, of, they're sort of climbing up the ship as it's as it's sloping downward. Mm -hmm. That would be the time that I would think that she probably got injured. But yeah, possibly. And of course, she's in a dress like the entire second half of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, most everyone else got to wear wetsuits under their clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, that it didn't work for that dress. So no wetsuit for you, Kate. Sorry, you were just freezing cold. Like the moment, the, the moment where she's gotten the ax and is going back to get Jack and, and the water has risen considerably and she gets into the water and you see that, you know, the, how people react when they get into cold water for the first mm -hmm. time, they do that, like inhale a breath. Yeah. Uh, that was Kate Winslet doing that right. because the water was really cold. Yeah. <laughs> that, that wasn't acting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, that's, that's miserable. It's funny. One thing I, I distinctly was aware of while watching this is like as a kid, I don't think I'd ever like been in really cold water. Um, and so it's very easy to just be like, just to just not empathize with how miserable. Yeah. And, just and, tough it out. Just and, tough and, it out. Yeah. Tough it out. Yeah. If, if I were, if I were immersed in freezing water, I would simply not die. Um, <laughs> but like, if you have any experience with like what it feels like to have like truly cold water on your body, you're, you're just like, yeah, this is, th this is extremely unpleasant. And also you're going to be dead soon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the uh, this is the reason why this is a masterpiece of a movie is because I think on the storytelling level, like we were talking about, it's great. But this technical level, they had never done anything like this before, mm -hmm. ever. I mean, the, the, the scale of it, like, I, I will say one little knock, the computer graphics have not aged well in some in, in some cases. In some cases, they're really yeah. good. But there's some shots very early in the movie where uh, Cameron really likes to pull out and show the Titanic sailing. And part of that shot is we're seeing how inhabited it is. We're seeing all the people on the decks walking and those people are CG as well. And they don't look good. They don't move like humans uh -huh. at all. They yeah. look real bad, actually. It was only really one shot that I noticed. And and then when it gets when we move into the darkness scenes, which is the whole shipwreck part, obviously, it becomes fine like I, yeah. I didn't notice anything wrong during any of those scenes. yeah 
Yeah, and, and again, Cameron is this, this uses every tool in his his tool belt, right? So it's this really great combination of these CG sequences with with uh, practical built versions of the set, like uh, just the the parts where the ship has really started to sink and and the angle has gotten so severe where we're just seeing people slide and I, and, and th- that he chose to s- snap the ship like practically, you know, like mm-hmm. in 2021, that would be a CGI effect, but that like we see the boards break, like it's just this designed mm-hmm. special effect that looks just fantastic. I love the sound work there too, with the first boards that break sound like gunshots. Mm-hmm. And I think that's intentional. Like it just, the, the power of it, I think that's all really, really, really well done. Yeah. Right. Just, all, all of the the mechanics of the whole thing I, I was really remembering how you know not only were there you know history channel documentaries and stuff but i remember watching you know features on like uh, uh you know news shows or whatever that were like and now we're going to talk to we're going to talk about the special effects of titanic because mm-hmm. everybody was so into it that that it was like it was it was just such a phenomenon it's so funny I, i'm just thinking how like even even something like endgame wasn't nearly as big a deal <laughs> as this <laughs> as this one disaster movie was <laughs> yeah it's kind of insane to think about i mean in-game probably made more money but well to actually i don't actually know if that's true in terms of in, in inflation uh, adjusting for inflation i don't know i mean it did make more money but yeah i don't know about the adjustment numbers but, but um definitely was like an entirely different beast i don't know yeah there's something that feels unique and different about the type of filmmaking and the type of special effects necessary for this thing versus an end game. Yeah. Like there's a huge amount of special effects in that, that movie, probably every single shot has some sort of special effect in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but this, yeah, I mean, it just feels like, it just feels like, I mean, it's James Cameron, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. at, the, at the end of the day, it's James Cameron using everything he's learned over the course of his career to create this movie that, that combines his love of, of action, his love of, of, uh, <laughs> ships and undersea mm-hmm. stuff uh, and the ocean and and his love of of special effects and to create this boat to he made he made the titanic there's there they didn't make a full scale replica but they got pretty damn close like this movie cost more money to make than the titanic <laughs> cost to build uh, that's great which is crazy i mean yeah. i think they said adjusted for inflation the titanic probably cost about 170 million dollars uh in 1997 money to to make uh, and this movie cost 200 million dollars to make so yeah well that that makes sense i mean they didn't the original titanic didn't have to pay for the destruction part but james cameron had to pay for that part so that's why that's probably the difference in in price yeah that's uh that, that makes perfect sense to me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean what what else i i, I will say you know I, i've just spent the last hour almost talking about how much i fucking love this movie there are parts in it that I think, you know, don't work as well as others. There's a little bit, just, just, just a little bit too much of winking at the audience about future knowledge stuff for me. Mm-hmm. Like the, the stuff where like they drop in, like, uh, who, who painted them? Oh, I don't know. Picasso something. Yeah, what's his name? Yeah. <laughs> There's just a little bit too much of that for me where we're like having a lot of fun with the audience. It's like, eh, we know that guy. And then and Cal is like confident. It's like, he'll never amount to a thing. Blood yeah. and blood. Uh, yeah. I, I know because I'm Cal. Yeah. It's like, sure. There's just a little, there's some, like, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me, but there are some lines like that where you're just like, come on, come on, movie. Like, come on. I, I kind of, it's funny. I mean, I, I, I think I agree. And also, I've come to see that kind of thing as just like so James Cameron, where, yeah, that's true. That's it's, true. he's, he's like having, f- that's, that's a lot of his style of humor, actually, is like sharing a little wink with you. I, I forget what the, uh, the 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 joke the guy the guy toward the beginning of the movie in the present day he he's he's trying to convince Bill Paxton that um, that Rose is is some kind of con woman and and he's like he he compares it to the Russian chick anesthesia the the, the Russian chick anesthesia yeah <laughs> um, which it, like that's like the most James Cameron joke ever and and that's <laughs> and and it's because it's like look at this idiot you know and and we have to laugh at him. Right. And, yeah. And and so that's that's the same the same basic joke, actually, is we're joke, we're laughing at what an idiot Cal is being in this scene. Right. Um, for for not recognizing, you know, the genius of Picasso. Um, yeah. I mean, but there's like I don't know, there's a difference between like there's a lot of James Cameron humor in this. Like I love um, when she comes with the axe and and he says, OK, now hit hit 
hit that thing over there as a practice swing. Now try to hit the same spot, Rose, and the axe like is embedded like two feet from the first one. And he's like, okay, that's enough practicing. Like that's <laughs> that's James, that's James Cameron humor. Right. Yeah. And and I think the other part where she goes, I'm gonna go get help, and then it's it's a cut back to Leo in the empty room, handcuffed to the thing, and he goes, Okay, I'll just stay here. Like that's a that's a Jim Cameron joke. Yeah. Like to a T. And and I, I really love that stuff. I love that kind of humor. And and to me, there's a difference between that kind of, uh, you know, silliness in the moment jokes and the winking at the at the mm. the future knowledge stuff. Yeah. You know, it, but so, so it, it's funny when we talk about like criticisms or stuff we don't like, because there would be moments, there'd be moments where, where I was sort of cringing is too strong a word because it implies it implies a stronger emotion than i was feeling but like this, some of the romance stuff i would feel like this is a bit this is a bit much this is a bit like more can i guess th- can i guess what scene you're, sure. <laughs> you're thinking of uh, i'm i'm flying jack uh-huh was that was that one of them i mean that's one of them yeah like there's <laughs> and the thing is it's kind of it's kind of throughout actually but but then when i really think about it i'm like Okay, but does that mean I, I don't want that in the movie? Does that mean that I really don't want that in the movie? Because if anything, I feel like the last ninety-five movies I've seen in theaters, like new, new movies, they're like they're like insufficiently dramatized. Like like when was the last time you just saw like a romance? <laughs> just like <laughs> That's a, a good just question. like just like a couple of people falling in love and doing it. <laughs> and like like I don't even remember the last time I've just seen like a straightforward romance that where yeah. some some something horribly fucked up didn't happen. <laughs> I mean aside from everyone dying um in, in, yeah. a, in a shipwreck. Yeah. Um I don't know if that's the best example no, but, of but, this map. But 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 I mean like within the relationship is kind yeah, of what no, I, I got gotcha. you. Um, I got gotcha. you. And uh I, I like I'm like you know what I don't mind it actually. Yeah, I mean look, here's the deal. People in love are cheesy, uh-huh. especially when it's new love. Right. Like you're just you 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 look back at some of the stuff you said when you were like she's supposed to be 17, right? Yeah. So like you look back at some of the stuff you said when you were 17 and in love, you'd probably cringe at that too. Right. But like that's part of love, yeah. especially this young this young very melodramatic uh, powerful love that these two people are feeling for each other. It's a little cheesy. It's a little cringy. Like that's just the way. That's just the way it is. I, I think that's why this movie was so successful. Like be, because like the 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 way the love story is shot and, and framed is the way you experience falling in love as yeah. a teenager. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, and it seems cringy to a thirty six year old because I'm a thirty six year old. And that doesn't mean that I I have the right to say that they should take that stuff out to, you know, no, that's stupid. I, I love it. The movie's perfect the way it is. Yeah. I mean, let me just say that every cruise I've been on in my entire life, which is only a, a couple, you know, 20 years ago, I was desperately hoping I would meet the woman I was going to fall in love with on the cruise ship. <laughs> Naturally, <laughs> that, that, of course. That I was just going to turn the corner on this cruise ship and there she was going to yeah. be and we were going to fall madly in love and uh, and leave the cruise together. Like yeah this is like this is the thoughts that people have especially young people and so yeah yeah i think you're absolutely right that to teenagers none of this was cringy this was all real powerful emotion and that's i i think i don't think that's a bad thing yeah no, like I, i'm no, agreeing with you here i'm not saying you're wrong i just i i think that is just that is just what people behave like sometimes yeah and and, and i think that's i think that's part of why it was successful. Like I, I think yeah. that there's a tendency to do, you know, romance in this very like mannered and sort of like at arm's length way because it's like the director or the, the you know the storyteller wants to show that they're you know I'm I'm too wise to really fall for this. Yeah, you know, no. and it's like and James Cameron's just like it's the love, it's yeah. love. They're in love. This movie commits fully to every one of its emotions. Like I mean, yeah. from from the the love they feel to the deep rage of Billy Zane when he flips that table you know Mm -hmm. like it is going to is going all in on every single emotion Mm -hmm. and that is what makes it feel like this epic powerful drama and that's what makes the movie work so yeah i mean you you carve out any of that and the movie is lesser for it for sure Mm -hmm. did you know that the 
every moment that takes place in 1912 in the movie adds up to the exact amount of time it took for the Titanic to sink. It's like two hours and 47 minutes or something. No, I did not. That's fucking bonkers, James. What are you doing, Mr. Cameron? Why did you do that? Yeah, that's that's uh, he, I don't know. He, <laughs> he he is a like that's that's the neat thing about him is he is this very rare like fusion of extremely extremely brilliant artist and extremely skilled like technical like engineer and he gets i think he gets really obsessive about like the clockwork technical perfection of of the the effects and yeah and the construction of the thing and like that's the kind of thing where making the making the film last exactly that amount of time strikes me as like something that he is doing both from the place of being an artist and being an engineer yeah i think you're right because the other the other thing was that the amount of time that the whole iceberg incident took is exactly what was reported. Like they, he, he did that beat for beat for what was reported Mm -hmm. about the actual Titanic. So he measured that exactly. So yeah, I think that is his engineering meticulousness coming out for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Anything else you have to say about Titanic, Matt? I, I, I've, uh, you're going to have to fight me at the end of this whole thing for this to not be number one on, on my Jim Cameron list right now that's how i'm feeling right now hmm. yeah I, I it's i mean I, I guess i'm i'm maybe more more open-minded than than i thought i would be before this rewatch because i hadn't watched it in so long mm-hmm. i mean just like from the technical and, and everything sides it's hard to disagree and just from like an objective standing back and looking at the cultural impact it's also kind of hard to disagree because mm-hmm. i mean i love aliens but this movie definitely dominated the world uh in a way that aliens did not so yeah definitely that that's um, definitely true last final things costuming incredible mm-hmm. every look every look that kate winslet wears in this thing is like damn mm-hmm. especially the 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 opening one with the the purple hat that like mm-hmm. reveals her face it's the perfect character reveal moment mm-hmm. gosh so good yeah yeah i mean everything about the the set decor and just yeah every yeah. aspect every aspect of the visuals the music is fucking spot on. Mm-hmm. I love the music in this movie so much. Yeah, and it's it's well used. It's tastefully used. It's not overwhelming mm-hmm. when it when you know it, it comes in when it needs to punctuate a moment, but then it backs off when you need to be focusing more on what's happening in the scene. I think that's actually pretty important, by the way, because it's yeah. very easy to kind of drown in the the music and and have that become like okay, well now we've crossed the line into too much melodrama. But the music, I think, is like just just the right balance. Yeah, it. it I mean. You know, it shows a lack of trust in in the movie mm-hmm. to generate the emotions. You know, like I mean, mm-hmm. it's m- music, as we've always said, is a cheat code towards mm-hmm. emotion, and it, and it can be used very cleverly to to enhance what the movie is already doing. But yeah, I, I feel like if you're insecure in your movies in your movie's ability to generate those emotions, you pump in the music to an absurdist level, mm-hmm. and and I think you're absolutely right that it doesn't do that. And everywhere it does it, it's like they know, like the the we've already kind of talked about this but the decision to layer the the band playing their final song over this kind of vignette of of death and and destruction and and horror as things escalate to really bad as the ship has really started picking up speed and it's sinking i just think it's it's just the perfect decision in that moment like it's just perfect like let's let's use the diegetic music in this moment to to enhance the emotion yeah. and then we'll cut back to the the longing James Horner score. Actually, that's a fantastic point that the diegetic music really makes a difference in terms of how it feels because Mm -hmm. it, that's just, it's like a thousand times more tragic to realize that like the sad, the sad music in the scene is these actual men who were actually playing music at the time. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Okay. So I think that's, that's it for me. Uh, Go watch Titanic. If you haven't, it's really fucking good. There's a reason why it won all the Academy Awards, mm-hmm. all of them, except for the acting ones. Poor actors. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Uh, OK, Matt, we have a choice here now. Uh, we're at the point in our Deconstructing Cameron series that we have to make a decision that we've kind of been putting off for a little bit of time because we can either move directly on to Avatar, our final film, or we do have two documentaries that Cameron made two feature length documentaries called ghosts of the abyss and aliens of the deep. They are both um, exploration of, of undersea life. I believe 
I believe Ghosts of the Abyss is a is a specific Titanic one. Although yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, it looks like it's um, the the poster is just a, a shot of the Titanic wreck, and it um, apparently also has Bill Paxton in it because he just can't get enough of Jim Cameron. Just, yeah, that's that that makes me really happy that Bill Paxton is the only one who stands by him. <laughs> So I guess, I mean, we've, we've talked about maybe dipping into these documentaries before, but we never really made a call on it and we're here now. And so we've got to make a call on this. So what, where are you leaning right now as far as what we should be doing next? I'm, I'm, I'm leaning toward watching the documentaries Okay. because I love documentaries and I would love to watch those. Yeah. Okay. Let think... me just make sure they're widely available before sure. we go down this path yeah they're okay they're for rent yeah and we've never really talked about documentaries and i think that would be a fun uh stretching of our legs sure so okay here's what we're gonna do Uh, our next film in our deconstructing cameron series will be the documentary ghosts of the abyss we'll kind of see how that goes and if that went well then we'll move on to the next one aliens of the deep and uh and if not we'll just move right on to avatar how's that sounds good All right. So our next Jim Cameron thing will be Ghosts of the Abyss, a 2003 documentary. It looks like it's available on for rent on just about all streaming platforms if you want to watch along with us. But uh, that is going to do it this week for Deconstructing Cameron. Do 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 do. All right, Matt, let's move on to our council vote from two weeks ago. A couple weeks ago, Matt, we talked about the Leica film Coraline. We both agreed it was one of the best animated films ever. Um, and we really, really, really enjoyed it. And we both agreed that it should be entered into our listing of greatest films of all time. But how did our audience vote? What do you think, Matt? What's your guess? I'm going to guess uh, strongly in favor. You are correct with a 95% vote. Coraline is inducted into the Doof canon of greatest films of all time. Welcome to our first and hopefully not only stop motion animation film, Coraline. Uh, happy, happy for this movie to be here. Yeah. I, I wonder how many people, if any, watched the movie because we were talking about it. I, I just, uh, I can't imagine any, anyone watching this movie and thinking like, nah, nah, it doesn't impress me, you know? So yeah. like, that, that, that's why I, that's why I was so confident that it would make it in, honestly, because it's, it's just like, oh, like you can't find a single flaw in this movie. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, once again, did not get any feedback from the folks that voted no, um, which is fine, but uh, we'll just have to, it'll just have to remain a mystery. Um, yep. The, the mysterious 5%. <laughs> There's always about that much on, even on the incredibly popular ones. Like I think even the movies like Mad Max and uh, Into the Spider-Verse, which I think have about the same percentage. There's, mm. there's still always a few and I'm really curious to meet those people. <laughs> yeah. Some, some, some folks just wanting to keep us on our toes, I guess. Yeah. But that is it for Coraline. Congratulations to Coraline and to Leica. I'm sure they will be very, very excited to hear that their film is in our illustrious list. Yeah. I'll send, I'll send them the email. Yeah. So um, if you are, if wanting to participate in this thing, head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash doof media, and you can find out how to be one of the people that nominates the films, how to be the people that vote for the films. Uh, so we can, we, we turn to our patrons. We, we let them control this process. You know, they nominate uh, our, our council nominates them. Then our general patrons vote out of those nominees for the movie for us to watch. And then our general audience votes on whether they're in. So, you know, this, process is kind of totally out of our hands and we want y'all to be involved in it so please please make sure that you do and, and head on over to patreon.com slash media to find out the more ways you can be involved yeah okay matt you ready you ready to be convinced to watch another tv show because you have so much free time all right hit me up man so i want to talk to you about this show it's called arcane do you know what arcane is what's well, arcane scott <laughs> Arcane is, and don't, okay, you can't stop listening midway, okay? Arcane is a cartoon based on the MOBA video game League of Legends. Did I lose you? Did I lose you? (laughs) Okay, so what this is, Matt, is a nine-episode series on Netflix. I've actually, at, at the time of this recording, only watched the first three, but I am so confident that you will like it that I am recommending it right now so remember when we were watching invincible 
and we were like, man, this is pretty good, except for the animation looks like poo poo. Mm-hmm. Remember that? What sure. if, what if the animation didn't look like poo poo? Mm-hmm. What if the animation looked incredible? Okay. I'm, I am see where you're going with this. <laughs> so yeah, um, the animation studio behind this is a, is a small French studio. They've been working on the show for six years and it it looks it it looks incredible not just like not just from a general motion and movement standpoint but like directorial decisions in the animation like where they're going to put the quote unquote camera uh it, it's one of those things you know we were talking we talked about this a lot with Coraline but it's one of those things that just like it, they directed and edited the shit out of this thing and it looks amazing it it moves amazing but i think more important than all that is the story right and this is a show First of all, I will say I've never played a minute of League of Legends. I don't give a shit about that game. I will not play it after watching this. I don't care. <laughs> I don't like MOBAs. I don't like that. I know nothing about the lore of this world. And I, I still don't know a lot about the lore of this world, to be honest with you. And perhaps in the remaining six episodes, I'll learn a little bit more. But this is just like very classic, good storytelling, like just really, really solid you know, back to basics storytelling where we we establish some characters and we put them through some stuff and we watch as they struggle and change and and unexpected stuff happens and and it's it's horrible in a lot of ways and and heartwarming in a lot of other ways. It's just like just you know it it it's not doing anything uh, new per se in the realm of storytelling. It's just really really solid fundamentals in a way that I think is is incredibly pleasurable to watch i do like storytelling <laughs> you know it's funny and this isn't uh I, I, I don't know i i just notice that many 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 people have now recommended this in my general direction mm-hmm. and yet i have no goddamn idea what it's about like yeah. and, and i'm not even necessarily asking you to tell me um it's, it's just interesting how I, I guess maybe people my guess my my guess would be that people don't want to spoil things yeah, I think it's I mean, it's just like what it is, quote unquote, about is the the thing that I'm concerned with the least. I guess the, the thing that it is about is two sisters. It's okay. it's about two sisters who whose parents are killed in, in a war. Um, They are kind of homeless. And at the beginning of the show, they've like been adopted into this like part of this underground. Like there's there's a very clear class of society in this world um, underground and above ground. So they are part of this underground group with this this guy who raised them like again, very traditional stuff, right? This mm-hmm. guy who raised them, took them in. He's like the head of the underground and kind of teaches them his his thieving ways. And I think I think maybe the reason people hold off on explaining that is because that doesn't sound great or original or new. Um, and that's not that's not why the show is good Mm -hmm. yeah i I mean it's just kind of i think it just is not a premise show it's Mm a it's a fundamentals show yeah and it's a character show like i mean these two sisters they are the core of it um one of the one of the sisters is played by Haley steinfeld who is having having a moment right now man she's in this show and she's in the new hawkeye show on uh, disney plus Mm. she's she's doing really well for herself Okay, cool. All right. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably going to make my way around to it right now uh, at some point Mm -hmm. um, after I clear the backlog. Yeah, I mean, I just think like it's worth your time. I'm going to watch the we we did Elliot and I uh, while you were away, we did a a watch party for the first three episodes. And then Elliot and Malia did it last week while I was doing Thanksgiving stuff. They did the next three episodes. So there's only three episodes left. I want to watch them and I want to do them in a watch party thing because I had so much fun with it. So maybe if you get there, it can be with you. If I, if I catch up real quick, possibly. (laughs) I mean, we don't, we can schedule it whenever we want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, that's arcane. Uh, Really, really shocked. Really? Like I, if I'm being totally honest with myself, I went into this thing being really negative and being like, like doing the exact thing I, I say never to do, which is like, Okay, show, convince me that you're worth my time. You know, I think it was just because like the the sheer amount and and seeming exaggeration of the recommendations really like like put up my suspicion radar. It was like, there's no way this thing is as good as these people are clearly clearly overreacting to and saying it is. And while I'm not like sitting gonna sit here and say, 
Matt, this is the best thing I've seen all year. This will change your life. No, it won't. It's just really, it's just a really, really well done story. And that's, that's all it has to be. Yeah, sure. Sure. I, I think, I, I don't know. I, I was just, I, I'm, a, I'm similar to you kind of allergic to, to people overselling things. I, I don't know why exactly, but um, I, I, I will give it a chance. I will at some point. Especially with the the stigma of video game stuff, you know. Yeah, um, I think I think I've finally gotten over that personally. Just just for myself, I've I've realized that um, if somebody has an idea for how to do something in a fun, creative way, uh, it doesn't matter what property they start with; they can make something cool. Yeah, no, I think you're right with that. But I I think I'm still carrying a lot of baggage for video game adaptation properties. But yes. Uh, Yes, not un, not undeserved. <laughs> All right, so that is Arcane. Is it available right now on Netflix? And Matt is going to go watch it as soon as we get off the mic. Uh-huh, Wait, that's sure, what you yeah. said, right? I think that's what you said. I, I mean, if you rearrange my the order of my words, then I guess so, yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, that is going to do it for us this week. If you have any opinions on anything we talked about today, feel free to reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or over at our Twitter account at doofmedia. You can also find us at our Reddit, that is r slash doofmedia, and our Instagram account at doofmedia. Yeah, and if you're not already subscribed to the Doofcast, we encourage you to subscribe and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. And if you like what we do here and want to support us, consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. Head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and look at all those different levels. There are bonus podcasts released every week at each different level. Um, so please check all that stuff out. It's great and we think you will enjoy it and you will be supporting us, which we love. That's right. Also, please consider rating and reviewing the Doofcast on Apple Podcasts. Every review helps us get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make here. That is right. All right, folks, we will see you all next week where uh, Deconstructing James Cameron continues with the 2003 documentary Ghosts of the Abyss. More Titanic talk. And you'll do what I say. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say.